Welcome everyone to Mindful Mondays with Laura Cross, where we are all about providing education, resources, connection, and collaboration to support you on your mindfulness and your wellness journey. And my guest today has gone from finance to fulfillment. Um, she is now the owner and head coach of Moxie Barbell, which is a one-on-one -on -one, uh, online coaching company. And she is passionate about helping clients push past their obstacles, building that confidence in the gym, growth, creating a growth mindset, and having non-restrictive nutrition habits. So with that, please welcome my guest, Carly Fleischer, the owner of Moxie, ba Moxie Barbell. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks welcome, so much for Carly. having me, Laura. I appreciate it. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. So that is quite the, the change. You went from finance over to, you know, fulfillment, the whole, uh, strength training. How, how did you come about that? Or can you fill us in a little bit on your story of how that, what that looked like for you? Yeah, for sure. I'll be honest. It's a, it's a long story. So feel free to pop in at any point, but yeah, I'm a, of my whole life, I've been very type A. I think you're kind of quintessential overachiever. And I think I had the model in my head. And I don't know if it came from me or societal pressure or parents or wherever it came from, but I had the model in my head of you perform really well in school, you get good grades, you get into a good college. Then while you're there, you do good internships and then you get a good job, you make a bunch of money and then you're happy. And so my whole life, that was the formula that I was following. And I mean, not to toot my own horn, but I was, I was really good at it. Like I, I was a great student. I did all the internships and I graduated from the university of Rochester with dual degrees. And I landed a job right out of school at Ernst and Young in their financial consulting division, which coming out of my major at my university is pretty much the pinnacle of success. Like everybody wanted that. I had people reaching out to me. How did you do that? Can you help me get this? And I felt that pride that I thought that I was going to get that kind of light at the end of the tunnel. But then I graduate and I go to work at EY and I am miserable. And <laughs> this was really hard because every other stage, like every internship I did, every class I was in, I wasn't necessarily the most happy, but I thought that that was just part of the process because I was like, oh, I'm not supposed to be happy here. This is just, this is part of the journey. I'm not supposed to be happy now. All of this stuff bundled together will eventually get me to the happy place. And then all of a sudden here I am and I'm in this alleged happy place. And I was probably the most miserable I had been up until that point. And it was a bit of a, I'm going to call it an early 20s crisis. I mean, I was 22 at the time, which like now seems ridiculous that I was panicking about what I'm going to do with the rest of my life at 22. But there I was. Um, and so I realized after six months, there's just no way I'm going to be able to sustain this for the rest of ever. This can't be the light at the end of the tunnel. But I am a naturally very risk averse person. And so the idea of doing a complete course correction at that point, it already felt like I was too late. So I started scouring for other jobs that would still capitalize on my degree and my skill set, but that were at least a little bit more exciting. And that was where my first kind of transition into fitness happened. So I quit EY and I went to go and work at a little, not super little, but a, a fairly small uh, meal prep delivery service called Kettlebell Kitchen. And so it was the perfect, I still call it my unicorn job because I was able to, <laughs> I was able to say I was in account management. So like sales and account management. So it was still, you know, a, a prestigious job. It was still something I could go home and tell my grandpa about and he would be proud of me. But I got to work with CrossFit gyms and I was in the gym all the time and I was like the happiest I had ever been. It was incredible. I was I was convinced that this was the thing I was going to do for forever. And then six months later, the company went out of business and it left me totally back where I started in a panic again of like, oh my gosh, now I know what I want to do, but this is the unicorn job, another job like this that has the safety and the security of sales or, you know, like a more traditional job mixed with fitness was not easy to come by because trust me, I tried very hard after they went out of business to find something similar. Um, one thing led to another. There's a lot of behind the scenes stuff 
COVID happened in this time frame. But I ended up then just taking another job at a different startup, lasted there for about six months, another job at a different startup, lasted there about six months, switched to a different role on that team, lasted there about six months. I'm sure you're catching a little bit of a You had a right six now. month trend going on. <laughs> and I was getting really self-conscious about that too, because every time I would apply, the question would come up of, well, you've got a little bit of jumping around on your resume. And I would tell people, I'm really trying to find that forever place, but I want somewhere that I'm really passionate about. And again, all of the lies I was telling them, I was also telling myself of, well, if I switch here, well, it's a smaller company and I'll have more autonomy and this and, and whatever it was to try to really get myself jazzed about the position. And yeah, it was on job, I guess it must have been five or six in about a three and a half to four year span when I realized that there was no more kind of little bit of pivoting that I could do that was going to make me happy. I really was going to have to make a more drastic shift. And behind the scenes in all of this, I had been involved in fitness. Um, I was an athlete my whole life, but I was never really involved in the gym and in lifting. But I had started that in college with huge credit to my then like one of my best friends, now my husband, um, who got me into lifting and I completely caught the bug there and fell down the powerlifting rabbit hole. And so was obsessed with all things fitness. And that was really what was going on behind the scenes. So when I realized on job five that, okay, I really need to do something drastic. That was when I decided, okay, I'm going to buckle down. I'm going to get myself certified. I had already been kind of helping friends here and there on the side who had asked me for stuff, but I realized that was really the passion area and the thing that I was obsessed with and that I would talk about nonstop and that I felt like I really had to do. So I got myself certified I quit my corporate day job. I started Moxie Barbell. And then I also got a job as a full-time in-person trainer at a gym to kind of help bridge the gap between now, the potential element of launching a business. Just to be, no, just to be clear though, how old were you when you, when you came to this? Cause you were talking about being in your twenties and oh, feeling yeah. like you were in a crisis and I, I'm 55 and I'll tell you, most of us didn't feel like we were in a crisis or figure out we need to do something different till we were like mid forties, fifties. And yeah. we were trained the same way. You go to school, get a degree, go get a job. And you think you're happy. Like you said, doing what you're supposed to do, but you're not yeah. truly happy. So, and yeah, I mean, so the fact that you even recognize that that early in life to me is amazing. But yeah, thank you. So what about what age are you now when you're like, you know, I need to do my own company? So that was just before my 26th birthday. So I was it was at the tail end of 25. So my mid 20s crisis had evolved from my <laughs> early 20s crisis. <laughs> I yeah, love how you I mean, refer to them as crisis, but I'm like, <laughs> I mean, I'm going to be honest at the time they really did feel like crises. They absolutely were. I mean, the, the period of time, the three or four months prior to me quitting my last corporate job and opening Moxie Barbell was probably the rock bottom for me. I was in a really dark place. I didn't see a way out just because I had done this five times before. And I thought, how many more times can I make a switch and it still not be the right fit? And that was what ultimately led me to realize I really needed to take some more drastic action and do the thing that felt riskier and scarier, even though it was scary and ultimately take the leap um, and believe in myself because it wasn't really a thing I had ever done before. I think I mentioned the first thing is I'm super risk averse and starting a business is risky and scary and there's a lot of unknowns and that definitely at the time was not my strong suit. Yeah, well, I, I'm so I, I don't mind risk myself a little bit here and yeah. there, but when you've been taught to do something and go to work, go to work for someone else and you do whatever it takes to make ends meet. And that's getting a job for like whoever, because in my generation, it was entrepreneurs were not talked about. And so for me, it was more of a self-confidence thing and doing that. So it's kind of, there's some, there's definitely, you know, some similarities there. Um, I never had a problem starting the business, but the reason why my business has never really started or went as strong as they could have was mostly, like you said, the whole self-confidence. Cause you start, 100%. you get a lot of people in your head. They don't understand what you're doing. They want to know what you're doing and um, and I think you were probably in a tough state too, because it's generations are changing. And I don't think a lot of people have caught up with that. So like when you say you're, you're going for another job and people are wondering, cause now you got five, six, well, 
<laughs> yeah. As an employer, you would look at that and, and just say, yeah, well, this one's not going to be around long. So why should they waste their time and resources? So that's exactly kind of Tough, yeah. And but... I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. I come from a fairly entrepreneurial background. My dad owned businesses my whole life. And when I came to him six months into EY at 22 years old and told him that I wanted to quit and go do something else, he actually advised me not to. And he'll admit now that that was the wrong bit of advice to give. But at the time he was stressed about it and he was nervous about me going and doing something different after I had, you know, gotten this big flashy degree and had everything that I thought I ever wanted. Yeah. No, I, I, I yeah, I can relate to that. I, I can relate to that. Mine. I didn't have the degree. I had the career and stuff. I had two and a half years of college. I just didn't have a degree yet when I went into the air force. And then I did that. And then just wherever we moved, I used to pick up, you know, a job, but that's, you know, the generation that I was taught and what it came from. So when I had the opportunity later, I went back to school and yeah, I got a bachelor's, I got a master's and I'm like, okay, so what I've been doing yeah, my now own what? Business for, I've been doing my own business for how many years now, like over 16 years. And they still aren't teaching people how to be an entrepreneur, even in college classes. And I was like, yeah, okay. So great. I, people made a big deal. Thought I should go to graduation. I'm like, what for? I finished in, you know, 2018. They want me to graduate in 19, 2019. I'm like, yeah, no, <laughs> so, it just didn't make sense to me, but I'm like, I'll have them. But yeah, I was like, nope, I'm pretty proud of what, what I do. Yeah. But so that's amazing. So you found your way through. So when you, so go ahead, continue. How did you get, I just had to say that, I mean, I just find it, I, I think it's amazing that you realized or you, you even felt that it was a crisis at 20, because I know when I was 20 something, that was just not a crisis. You just went to work and did yeah. what you had to do, but you well, recognize that. Yeah. And I mean, again, looking back on it now, like Again, I acknowledge I'm 27. I can look at it now and have a little bit of a chuckle about it and realize, you know, it was kind of ridiculous that at 22, I thought it was too late for me to change careers. And I think that's the biggest lesson that I walk away from that with is that it's not too late. It's never too late. But that is very much the type A perfectionist coming out of me that I had to have my entire life together at 22, because if I didn't, then it affected the one year plan, the five year plan, the 10 year plan, and it pushed all of that back. But um, yeah, so to continue the story a little bit. So fitness was the thing behind the scenes that I was obsessed with. And I got myself certified and so quit the corporate job and decided I was going to start the business. But that was still a really scary endeavor. And again, the risk averse person inside of me knew that I wasn't going to be able to, you know, quit my lucrative job and start a business and turn a profit overnight. So I got a job working in person at a gym. And so I've been, I still hold that job. Um, so I work full-time in person as a trainer, which is incredible experience and also helped me bridge the financial gap and gave me a little bit more of a runway while I built mm -hmm. out the business. But even once I quit my job and got that job, it still probably took me another three or four months before I pulled trigger on starting Moxie. Um, I came up with like every excuse in the book. First, it was, oh, well, I, I just got out of this. I just want to give myself a little bit of time to decompress and kind of coast. And then it was, well, I can't figure out a name and I can't start a business until there's a name. And then it was, well, this feels too scary. And I really give a ton of credit um, to my aunt for this. My aunt Julie, she said to me, she was incredibly encouraging the entire time, probably one of the only people from the beginning that said, this is what you're meant to be doing. You should be following this path, go and do it. And she said, you just need to rip off the bandaid and do one scary thing. You need to commit to doing one scary thing that lets you actually acknowledge that you are a business owner and that you're starting this business. And at the time, that scary thing was signing up for a free webinar that was about the systems that you need to help scale a fitness business. And it was with somebody that was fairly prominent in the industry. And again, at the time, the idea of getting on a webinar with somebody that's pretty successful in the industry and admitting that I have a business, but that I have no idea what I'm doing and I need some help was petrifying. Um, and but that's that's literally where it started. I met him. He became my business coach. He helped me, you know, get things off of the ground and create a scalable framework. And from there, I hit the ground running. And once I got started, I became so enveloped in the passion that I have for the business and how 
grateful I am to get to wake up every day and do it, especially knowing what the alternative is of knowing what it feels like to wake up with crippling anxiety, stressed Mm -hmm. about what the entire day is going to look like. So I really just needed that little push to get started. And from there, I'm not going to say it's been smooth sailing. It's been a lot of growth in the last year, but I started and I'm doing the damn thing. And I'm pretty proud of that. And I'm really, really, for the first time, super happy and proud of the life that I'm building for myself. And you should be. And I, I think there's a lot of us that go through that. I know myself, I did as well. Um, you know, and it, I, I've always been a perfectionist myself. Um, you know, people always call me that. I told them, I said, you call it perfectionism. I call it pride. <laughs> call it, <laughs> call it, what, call it what you want, you know? Um, but the truth is, is when you do that, it holds you back because either you have the, like you said, the questions you're asking yourself. So to me, that's kind of might be more a little bit towards the self-confidence thing. But then the other thing is, you know, the whole perfectionist trying to make wait for everything to be perfect. If we, nothing is ever perfect, which I've finally learned. And I'm like, you know what? It's okay to be you and be yourself. And when I had those same mentors, yeah, it was always kind of intimidating. But one of them that I had said, you know, don't put me on a pedestal because it hurts when I fall, <laughs> you know? So it, it's, it's not like, you know, they put, don't put, they're actually down to earth willing to help and everything, but we like put, tend to put them on some kind of pedestal. And, you know, again, I think it's just something else that plays with the self-confidence and the perfectionism, but. Yeah. I learned because again, I did have this plan for myself my whole life. I think the biggest lesson that I've learned is that sometimes the plan can be more detrimental than it can be helpful. I'm a very list oriented person. And so I always like to have a plan because then I know exactly what I'm doing and I can follow it and I can cross the things off the list. And that's really what moves me forward. But I've realized that life throws curveballs at you nonstop, like you not loving your dream job, like your dream job going out of business, like a global pandemic and all kinds of other things. And if you're too rigidly stuck to the plan, then you really are setting yourself up for failure because if you can't pivot and you're trying to now stick to a plan that is no longer realistic, given what's actually going on in the world versus the hypothetical world that you created this plan in, then you have no way to pivot and learn and grow from that. So I think now I do a little bit more of educated guesswork in my planning and have a general trajectory, but really try to remind myself that the plan and all of that is a lot more fluid than maybe I would like for it to be. But at least the fluidity lets me have a little bit more flexibility in how I end up actually implementing. And you should have a lot less anxiety that way too. That also. Yeah, it helps. (laughs) Yeah, it definitely, definitely helps. Cause yeah, I used to do that too. I used to have to plan things out or I'd have something planned to say this, this, that. And if it didn't come out, I'd be so frustrated, so upset. And I'm just like, you know what? I watch other people, other people stumble too. It's like, uh, me, it's human. It doesn't always come out right. I figure, you know, you're going to resonate with who you're going to resonate with. Totally. So, so th- is that when, so was it the pandemic that, um, with the 2020 that, Um, encouraged you more to go online rather than having your own business or overhead ease or? Yeah. um, Good question. So, I mean, part of it is that my lifestyle has been very nomadic since I graduated from college. I think I've moved, gosh, one, two, three, like five or six times in the time frame of having all of those jobs. And the couple of the other jobs that I had been working were remote. And I really liked that flexibility there. But the other thing and the primary thing that really drew me to online coaching is how much more of a holistic experience I can provide for my clients. And I know that given the experiences that I have working physically in a gym, I love the work that I do in a gym. And I think that, you know, training with a personal trainer in person has a tremendous amount of value, especially for those that are really not sure exactly what they're movement patterns look like and need that one-on-one support of making sure that you're not going to get injured and that you're learning to lift with proper form. But the type of coaching that I do is definitely a lot more holistic and it transcends what you maybe think of when you first think of strength coaching or nutrition coaching. So when I work in the gym, it's really just the workouts themselves. But when I work with clients online, it's 
really thinking about how we can help people live the healthiest, happiest, and most fulfilled lives. And that is so much more than what you're just doing in the gym or what you're doing in the kitchen with your diet. So with online, I talk to clients about all things biofeedback. So we're talking about sleep and stress management and energy levels and bowel movements and all kinds of digestion and things like that. So we're getting really into the nitty gritty and the weeds and we're going into habits and routines and like nighttime rituals and how you're managing your stress and how your environment supports you and what does your support system look like. So the structure that I have online lets me dive in with clients in a way that is so much more robust than what you're able to really do with them in an hour long session in person. And that was the main drive that pushed me there because I think the big thread through all of my careers was relationships. I love people. I'm a pretty textbook extrovert and I just really like building relationships with people. And I wanted to have a business and have a platform where I could do that, where I could reach a really wide audience, where I could have my own flexibility to travel and be a little bit more nomadic and not necessarily be tied to one place, but also where I could really feel like I'm making a difference in lots of different areas of people's lives and not just the one part of they're going to the gym and then they go home and I don't see them until their next session. So that's really the big, I guess, differentiation for me. Yeah. And we're going to dive into more of that in, in a little more detail. Cause like you said, it's not just yeah. about, you know, building the muscles. There's a lot more uh, to it and how you do that, but we are going to take a quick break from our sponsors and we will be right back. crypto curious maybe it's a little too scary for you to get involved in all this crazy bitcoin cryptocurrency stuff join me your host charlie stivers of goose live find us on the chief tv thursdays noon mountain time where we talk all things crypto And we are back. And before we dive into all those details, I have got to ask you, how did you come up with the name Moxie Barbell? Yeah, definitely not the first person to ask that one. Um, I wish I had some crazy story about it. I definitely don't. Um, when I was first coming up with the name, I think I mentioned it was a huge roadblock of me kind of delaying starting the business, trying to come up with the perfect name. And I knew I wanted to have something in the name Barbell Fitness gym, strength, something that alluded to kind of the ethos of what I was doing. And so I honestly spent a lot of time with an online thesaurus and kind of plug and play with a lot of different words and seeing what jumped out at me. And I can't even remember what word it was that I had put in that eventually spit Moxie back out at me, but it really did just kind of jump off of the page. And I think what I struggled with is I had Moxie Barbell in my head for a while, but I had gotten a lot of feedback again from my dad saying, well, I don't think people of your generation are going to know what Moxie means. And I was like, really? You don't think they're going to know? And I mean, it turns out a lot of people my age don't know what Moxie were. Frankly, a lot of the other vocab that I <laughs> use actually means. But for those who don't know, to me, Moxie was all about that spunkiness and vivaciousness and the vitality and the charisma and all of that. And it really encompassed everything that I wanted to explain in the business of really that it does transcend. It's not just strength. It's not just nutrition. It's that all encompassing aspect. And for anybody that doesn't know what Moxie means, 
I thought it still is a really cool sounding word <laughs> that just kind of rolls off the tongue. It had good dialect with barbell. So I wish there was like a better story around it. But honestly, I, I, I love it. Word... I'm, I'm, I'm old <laughs> enough to know what moxie is. And, and given the fact that you had just, you know, realized all that stuff, discovered it at such a young age and jumped from this, this, uh, you, you got to have a lot of moxie to step well, out. That of was exactly, that was exactly what it was, is like, I felt like I had moxie to be able to do this. And I also wanted it to be clear that the clients that I work with, you have to have moxie to invest in yourself and go through the kind of holistic journey that this is to really dive into this sort of behavior change. And incidentally, on my website, too, if you check it out, you any of the like action items on there to go and actually jump in and schedule a call with me will ask you got moxie. So <laughs> that is kind of where it comes from. <laughs> I love it though. It is, it, it's a great play on words. And if nothing else, it's a conversation piece because people that totally. don't know if they have the guts anyway, they'll ask you, but yeah, it, it's amazing sometimes with that generation gap. I, I took my car and one time I was talking to the tech while I was waiting to pull my car up. I mentioned Chinese fire drill. And he's like, what's that? I'm like, wow. Okay. I'm getting old. I said, okay, Google that. You can, you can Google it. We got Google nowadays. Go Google it. It's just like, <laughs> oh. so, so dig in a little more. Cause you there's a reason you do all this. I mean, it's important. And um, I know we've talked a little bit about it before. I, I don't think everybody necessarily realizes that the nutrition, the fitness and all of that and how it plays and affects in all aspects of your life. It's not just the whole physical health. Correct. Yeah. And so most people that come to a coach, they're looking for help with really guidance and accountability. And the number one thing that I hear from people is, I've tried so many things before in the past, but nothing has ever stuck. I've tried, you know, X, Y, and Z, but then life happens and then everything falls apart. And that's honestly the biggest crux of coaching. People don't need me just to write them a strength program or just to tell them what their macros are. To be honest, if you need that at this point, you can just go and ask ChatGPT for it. But the big <laughs> thing that people really need from a coach is help figuring out how to actually implement those things into their lifestyle in a way that's actually sustainable. So the key with all things health and fitness is consistency. And ultimately, the thing you can do consistently is going to get you results that you can sustain for the long term. So my whole ethos of my business is helping people create a health and fitness routine that fits your unique lifestyle. And the way that I approach that with coaching is, yes, I may be an expert in progressively over progressively overloaded training programs. I may be an expert in macros and macro tracking. I may be an expert in habits and routines and rituals and all of that stuff, but you're an expert in your own life. Nobody knows the ins and outs of your life better than you do. So I really look at my coaching as a coaching relationship, as something that's very collaborative and iterative, where I have the tools and the resources that I seek to educate my clients on so that I can help empower them to ultimately incorporate those things into their lives in a way that makes sense. Because somebody that is in their early 30s and has a newborn and a toddler and is working a full-time job, what's going to fit in their lifestyle looks really, really different than somebody who's 25 and maybe fresh out of school and doesn't have any responsibilities besides themselves. The time allocation looks different. The stressors look different. The support system looks different. So you really have to take into account all of those different things when you go to create a successful program with somebody. And again, I'm not the kind of coach that just wants to give you a training program and tell you to go to the gym and be on your merry way. I want you to look, feel, and perform your best across every domain of your life and that does entail thinking about things like your sleep and your habits around sleeping and wakefulness. It does entail the foods that you're eating, but not just your macros, right? It's how much protein are you getting? How much fiber are you eating? How much water are you drinking? What does your alcohol intake look like? It's a stress management thing. It's how are we setting up your environment so that it aligns with your goals? What does your support system look like? Who are the people you're surrounding yourself with? When life throws you curveballs, 
What do you do? How do you alter the plan to make sure that you don't just fall off the wagon and be like, well, my current plan doesn't fit the, ne the new curveballs that life has thrown at me. No, it's about giving you the tools to be able to adapt that and have you feel confident and empowered enough that you do have the tools in your toolkit to be able to pull from whenever different things happen. So it's a very education focused coaching program. It's very client centric. Um, and it's really focused on like health behavior change of how do you really focus on the psychological underpinnings of what makes people more likely to change their behavior and to actually want to do so for a long period of time. And you just mentioned a word that I think almost are all coaches or at least coaches that are trying to meet their, you know, people where they're at and work with them in a way you almost kind of be, feel like you become a psychologist. Cause there are times, like you said, when people life throws stuff at you and if someone has thrown something at your client and they're just all stressed, they're really not focused on what you're doing. So sometimes I, I would assume you would have to find a, a time to just say, okay, let me know what's going on. Cause you know, if you don't clear that air, how do you move on and work forward? Yeah, a hundred percent. And I do that with my clients through a myriad of different check-in processes. So all of my clients on a weekly basis, they complete what's called a weekly check-in. And it's basically a robust feedback loop on their week. It's a chance for them to sit back and reflect. And yes, tell me about the gym. Yes, tell me about nutrition. But you're also telling me what felt difficult about sticking to the plan this week. What are two compliments you can give yourself this week? Some things that you're proud of. You know, what extra support do you need from me? What are the goals you were focusing on last week? And we basically use your real life and the experiences that you're having to inform how we teach you and the skills that we need to help you learn. So I have a lot of clients, for example, that struggle when it comes to going out to eat or going out for drinks with friends and how do they integrate that if they're trying to lose body fat or they're trying to gain muscle? How do those things coincide? So when somebody checks in with me and they say, oh, I went out to dinner on Friday night and I freaked out and I definitely overate and now I'm feeling so guilty and I don't know what to do and now I feel like I don't like deserve to actually eat all of the food I have for me tomorrow we that's we take that opportunity to reflect and say okay what were the thoughts and the feelings that you were having before that event during that event after that event what could we have done differently right how do we set you up for success in those future situations so that every time you experience something instead of using it as an opportunity to spiral we really use it as an opportunity to grow and help fill some more tools in that toolbox for you for next time yeah, and that, and that makes a big difference because when you start spiraling, uh, spiraling down, and we're always so good at beating ourselves up. But yeah. I, and, and I like that too that you like you know make them. How did you feel? You know, I mean, and make them celebrate the wins and not just you know because we do a good enough job. Other people beat us up too, but we normally do a good enough job of beating up ourselves. <laughs> Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think too, like a lot of coaches, especially when it comes to negative emotions, we just are really tempted to push the negative emotions aside and say, oh no, no, like it's okay. You did fine. It's just one time. We're not going to let it happen again. And we don't really acknowledge those negative emotions. But I will say, I definitely spend a lot of time talking about all the full spectrum of emotions that come up with clients because emotions are really the messengers in your body that are telling you how you're reacting to the world around you. And there's a tremendous amount of value that you can get from really kind of analyzing and acknowledging what those emotions are telling you. And then not just pushing them aside and saying, oh, you know, that's not going to happen again. Well, the reality is you're coming to me as a coach, probably because it's happened more than one time. We don't want to just push it aside and pretend it's not happening. We want to use those emotions as fuel to remind you why changing your behavior is important to you, why that thing matters to you, instead of just trying to stifle it and push it down because maybe it feels uncomfortable. Yeah. And maybe you can tell me a little bit more because I know yours says non-restrictive nutrition because most yeah. people associate with working out, going to gym. Okay. Now I've got to cut out this, cut out that, or I have to have so much of this, so much of that. And I think that frustrates and stops a lot of people. It's like, cause you feel like you're losing everything that you enjoy. So when you're talking non-restrictive nutrition habits, what does that look what, like? Yeah. Good question. Um, so I will say it's one of the things that frustrates me a lot too. And in my own journey, when I first started, I mean, so many of my coaching practices now are informed by things that I did 
kind of wrong along the way and things that I learned from it. And I was like anybody when it came to dieting, it was calorie counting and it was having to cut everything out of my diet. And you can only do that for so long, right? Like everybody has a certain amount of willpower and self-control that they can employ, but it takes effort. And every decision you have to make throughout the day, especially when you've got other stressors coming at you, eventually you run out of self-control. So maybe for a day or a week or even a month, you can say, I'm not eating any cookies. I'm not going to have any late night snacks. I'm not going to drink any alcohol. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. But eventually something's going to happen and you're going to snap, and then you're going to go so far in the other direction. And that's when, again, the lack of sustainability comes in. So my whole approach to, yes, nutrition, but really everything is if you can't do it sustainably, if you don't feel like you can do this habit consistently, well, then it's probably not a habit that we should be implementing into your life. So when it comes to nutrition for me, I really like to talk to clients less about what are the things that we need to subtract from your life and more about what are the things that we can add to your life. So if we're thinking about that through the lens of nutrition, say fat loss is the goal for somebody. Yes, that does mean you need to be in a calorie deficit. I haven't magically come up with some way to usurp the science of that. And there are objectively some sacrifices that you have to make there. But instead of looking at it like I can't eat this, I can't eat that, I can't eat this, well, I can eat a lot more fruits and vegetables, and that's going to provide me with a lot more volume in my diet that's going to make me feel more full. I can eat a lot more protein because that's going to support muscle protein synthesis, and it's going to help me feel fu full for longer. I can focus on eating whole nutrient-dense foods that are going to make me feel my best. So it's focusing a lot on the kens and the things that you can add versus the things that you can subtract. But this also goes back to that individual component of that the plan is going to look different for everybody. And the non-restriction looks different for everybody. So for some clients, that does look like macro tracking. And macro tracking can be a way for clients to feel really empowered and know that, you know what, if I'm going to go out for dinner later tonight, well, I know now I need to have some leaner protein earlier in the day because dinner is probably going to be a little bit higher in carbs and fat. For some clients, that looks like using their palms to learn how to track food measurements and building awareness around the foods that they eat. For some clients, that looks like some self-regulation with food journaling and things like that. There's a ton of different habits and a ton of different ways that we can help clients build awareness around the foods that they're eating. But ultimately, any diet, and I like hesitate to even use the word diet, but any nutrition strategy that you're using, you should be thinking about how that's going to add to your life and why those changes are important to you. And know that there really isn't a one size fits all approach. There's a million different ways that we can do it, but it ultimately just comes down to helping you build more awareness around what you're currently doing and then learning how to make some smaller changes that make a really big impact in the day-to-day -day life. Right. It, it, and I 100% agree. It's like, we're all individuals for a reason. So what works for me is not necessarily going to work for you or work for someone else. We've got different perceptions, different goals. So I absolutely love that you meet people, you know, what, where they're at. Um, when you're talking about those, I can, I can, to me, that reminds me a lot of doing like the positive affirmations and being more positive mindset. Is that partly what you're talking about as far as a growth mindset? Yeah. So growth mindset is a, a common phrase in psychology. And it basically, the underpinning of it is this idea of self-efficacy, the idea that you can overcome obstacles, that you can continue on towards your goals in the face of adversity. And so the idea of the growth mindset is really teaching people to have that confidence and feel like, yes, I can do this even when it feels hard. I can do this even when life throws curveballs my my way versus having a little bit more of the alternative to that, which is a fixed mindset of the, I can't do this. I can't change. I can't adapt. I can't grow. So it's really teaching people to build confidence in themselves. And that's a huge component of it. I mean, anytime we think about behavior change, everybody knows that going to the gym and eating healthy is objectively good for you, right? But why mm -hmm. doesn't everybody do it? 
the reason why is because objectively there are pros and cons to it. And when it comes to making changes to your behavior, people that aren't making changes see more cons than they do pros. So one of the textbook things when it comes to behavior change is really helping you identify what are more pros. Let's really bolster the positives of why you want to change this behavior and then working on what are some comebacks to those negatives. So when your brain does inevitably come up with, well, it's too hard. I don't have enough time. I could be doing X, Y, or Z. Well, really bringing it back to why is this important to me? What are all the benefits that I'm going to get from it? Those are the things that are going to help you stay really grounded in your why you're doing something and not just, ugh, I'm doing it and it feels really difficult. And why is this even worth it in the first place? Yeah, no, absolutely. So when you do it, are you doing um, one-on-one only online or do you ever do group sessions? Yeah. So my one-on-one coach or my coaching online is predominantly one-on-one. It's not like I'm sitting on a Zoom call with you and doing the workout with you or anything like that, but it is a one-on-one coaching process in which you are receiving your training programming from me. You're receiving your nutrition programming. You're checking in with me both virtually and via Zoom calls, and you have access to me all of the time. And the reason why I really focus on the one-on-one is because of that individualized component. I do a little bit of group coaching with a uh, a roller derby team actually so we do like group coaching for cross training specifically for the goals of getting better at roller derby but when it comes to the more holistic coaching, it's really challenging to do that in a group capacity because you're never going to have a homogenous group. There's never going to be one set of strategies that works perfectly for everybody. I Every single one of my clients does things a little bit differently. So it is that individualized component that ultimately lets people be super successful in this type of a coaching relationship because they're having a plan that's totally tailored to them versus one that might be more plug and chug for a larger group. Right. And sometimes like I've heard a number of different things. Sometimes larger groups can be good because maybe they hear a different idea or something, or maybe someone else asks a question that they're afraid to ask. So I know they can be good, but then I know there's also people that maybe feel more comfortable just talking more openly and being more open, especially when you're going to start digging into a lot of personal issues and stuff as what's blocking them from doing this and that. So one-on-one on that hand for most people would be ideal. Yeah, it really, really is. And I will say the coaching process gets, for lack of a better word, intimate, right? We're talking about, in a lot of cases, things that are really triggering for people. I mean, I have clients that come to me that are, you know, recovering from really disordered eating that have really like difficult relationships with food and struggle with body confidence and the image that they see when they look at themselves in pictures and they look at themselves in the mirror. And those are really deeply personal issues, but those are the types of things that you really need to address in this type of a coaching environment because it is really influencing why making these changes are so important to you. So those are things that we talk about, right? Of not just how do you stay consistent in the gym, but how do you start to love yourself when you look in the mirror? How do you start to build that confidence? How do you go to a restaurant and not freak out about the food and actually be excited about spending time with the people that you're with? So those are really deeply personal things and really challenging things that people deal with. And the reason why I am the type of coach that I am now is because I'm the type of coach that I wish I had at the beginning of my own journey when I was restricting, when I had totally disordered eating, when I was looking in the mirror and not liking what I saw. If I had somebody that could help walk me through that process and help me get more in touch with that and why those things were happening instead of me just restricting and making my life even more difficult. Um, It's really getting to the crux of why people are having those feelings and then using those feelings to fuel new behavior changes. So a lot of the things that you do and you help people with, they're things that you're kind of intimately familiar with because you've struggled with them and done them yourself, which I, I think knowledge is always great. Certifications are always great. But I think it's the combination when you have, you know, or, or the experience, because anybody can get a degree, but if somebody hasn't like experienced something that maybe I'm going through, then you get kind of hesitant working with them because how can they possibly, I won't say understand, but how can they relate, you know, to maybe how you feel or what you went through unless it's something they experienced themselves? No, totally. I mean, I, I eat, sleep and breathe fitness and all of this stuff. I mean, my 
my undergraduate degree, one of them is in psychology. So this is, I'm coming at this right from an educational perspective and I have all of the certifications, but if I wasn't living it, if I wasn't walking the walk, I wouldn't feel authentic in the type of coaching that I'm offering because so many times clients are coming to me with these, you know, novel issues. They're not things that I'm getting from a textbook. They're things that clients are telling me that I've also experienced feelings that I've also had. And I'm using experiences from my own life and certainly experiences from other clients as well to really inform the the type of processes that we're implementing for clients that come to me with these issues. But if I didn't know what it felt like to have a, a terrible relationship with food, to struggle with my own body image, to restrict my own eating habits, then it would be really hard, exactly like you said, for me to relate to clients that are coming in with those similar frustrations. But because so many of the people that come to us for coaching really are coming from a similar sort of place, it feels incredibly unique and it feels really isolating, like you're the only one going through it. But then all of a sudden, when you start working with a coach that's been there and that's been through it, it gives definitely a different level of confidence from the client perspective. And it just gives a different sort of relationship than if I was coming at it from an outside third party and I had never done any of this stuff myself. I, I was my OG guinea pig. I did all of the experimentation on myself <laughs> first. It's, it's like your own personal support group, you know. Exactly. <laughs> Yep. Nope. Totally get that. And I have to say we're, we're what about a good three years now since the pandemic started. So you, you've broke your six month cycle. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I have. I have broken my six month cycle. Um, Moxie is now pretty much officially the longest I've been at any job. Technically I was at one company for longer than a year, but I switched from the sales team to the operations team about six months in. So depending on how you want to slice it, it was about six months, although it was a year tenure at the company, but yeah, Moxie is now my longest standing job and uh, by all intents and purposes should be the last one that I ever have. <laughs> but, and you're obviously much happier than you were before. Yes. <laughs> oh, it's a night and day difference. Like, like I said earlier, I mean, it's just, I know what it feels like to wake up every single day with crippling anxiety and to not be excited for what the day has in store. So now, even on the hardest days, even on the days when I'm really stressed and, and spread really thin, I have a tremendous amount of gratitude. And that's the thing that I think carries me through the most. And that just makes me the most excited to get up and do what I get to do. But I genuinely love working with people. I get so jazzed when I see a client check in and tell me that they felt really good when they looked in the mirror today or that they went out to dinner and they enjoyed themselves and they weren't just thinking about the calories in that meal. Like that stuff lights me up to know that I actually get to make a tangible difference in people's lives. So yeah, to say that I'm happier now is pretty much the understatement of my 20s. <laughs> Yep. And you got to be proud that you, you pitched aside the perfectionist and, and perfectionism and did that. And I'm sure your, your clients are much happier for that as well. Yeah, I would hope so. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So what do you see on the horizon for you? Where, you? where do you go from here? Where does Moxie Barbell go from here? Yeah, it's a great question. So, I mean, to be honest, hopefully we keep going in the same direction that we're going in for right now. I launched Moxie Barbell less than a year ago. So I'm still very much in the, the growth phase of the business where I'm continuing to expand, continuing to build on my skill set, and continuing to expand on the number of clients and ultimately the number of people whose lives that I am able to influence. So looking ahead to the next year, you know, the first year was really focused a lot on scalability and creating processes that were, you know, I could actually scale the business on and figuring out how I was going to get paid and how I was going to schedule and how I was going to deliver programming. And now my hope for the next year is that I get to continue to work with a lot of really awesome people. I get to continue to influence more and more people's lives, but ultimately that I get to work in a little bit more of a creative capacity and I get to do stuff that feels really fun and innovative. And this goes back to a lot of the, you know, the paralysis of the plan. I don't have a, an exact roadmap of what the next year looks like, because to be honest, 
I have no idea what's going to happen. I have no idea who I'm going to meet or what opportunities or experiences I'm going to have. But the plan for the next year is to stay open, to stay excited, to continue to be creative and get to grow the business and keep waking up every day and doing what I love. Yeah. And that, and that's a big part of it, doing what you love, because there's too many of us that are going to what we call the J-O-B or the just over broke, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, we do it, I, whether it's out of a sense of um, responsibility, but you know, you, you do it because you figure that's what you have to, that's the only options. But when you start knowing that there's other options, and like you said, there, there is that anxiety. Cause I remember back in those days, it'd be like, oh, no, I really don't want to go to work. I don't want to, or maybe there's a coworker you didn't necessarily have to, but you got to deal with it. You got to suck it up because you know, they're there. And, but then when you do give your notice and you're in your last two weeks, you get that like short <laughs> It's like, you get this little burst of, yeah, don't really care. Oh, yeah. I'm almost done with this, but <laughs> I know it. Well, I will say the thing I miss the least from working in that corporate setting is the optics. The having to put on a certain show just to make it look right for everybody else. That's been probably the most liberating thing about getting to own and operate my own business is I get to do what feels authentically right for me and for my clients. I don't have to do stuff because I'm beholden to somebody else or any, like literally anything. I get to ultimately make decisions that I feel like are going to give my clients the best experience possible and be client centric in a way that I never had the opportunity to do in the past. And that has been the coolest thing. Well, yeah, because you get to help people, which obviously you're a very caring person that wants to help people. So you get to help people and do that and, and be your own boss. For me, too, a lot of it was having my own time, you know, yeah. ha having your own time to just pick up and go if you needed to. I didn't have to answer to anybody else, um, you know, and you make your own schedules. So, so the Moxie Barbell, the website we have up here, is that the best way for people to connect with you? Yeah, so definitely you can connect with me via my website, which you can access by the QR code below or by visiting moxiebarbell.com. And from there, you can learn all about my coaching services and you can also schedule a free one on one consult call. So that's really the first step in the coaching process is to schedule that call so that you and I can have a chat about your goals and what's important to you and what you're looking for out of a coaching relationship and make sure that we are a really good fit to work together. Um, and then you can also follow me on all social platforms. So I'm on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Moxie Barbell. I post a ton of educational content in all things in the gym, in macro tracking, in meal prepping, in habits, in lifestyle, and overall mindset and mindfulness. So shameless plug to follow along there because there's definitely a lot of fun content that comes out. That's okay. That's that's good to know because yeah, meal prepping, we didn't even really get to touch on that, but that's that can be <laughs> a big part of, you know, having the right meals ready and not the, oh, I don't have time to do this and and there's a ton of different ways to do that too. I think people think about it as just the little meal prep containers and having everything weighed and measured out, but there's so many different strategies for that that we implement with people as well. And that's one of the most fun things when I start working with any new client is the beginning is really just data collection. It's you're the expert in your life. Help me also become a little bit of an expert. Let's see what your day-to-day -day looks like. Let's build some awareness. And then let's pull in some habits that are going to fit you, get you excited, and that you can ultimately do sustainably. So whether it's meal prepping or literally anything else, moral of the story is there's no one size fits all. <laughs> there's there's no one size fits all in anything. If people think no. there is, I've got bad news for you, there isn't. <laughs> <laughs> But I want to thank you, Carly, very much for joining us today and sharing all of that. I really look forward to seeing where this goes because you mentioned meal prepping. I was going to say you could even hold your own little meal, mini prep, you know, meal prepping mini course or or videos or tutorials for people. I mean, there's a lot of directions and stuff you can go. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there you could probably collaborate with as well and expand. Is there anyone we got a couple minutes real quick. Is there anyone that you're looking to collaborate in and in, in expanding? Or are you just focusing on the growth right now? Um, it's a great question. Not off the top of my head. I don't have anybody in particular that I'm really looking to, you know, grow or collaborate with. I am definitely, you know, using this opportunity right now of growth to get to talk to a lot of different people in the space and join people on podcasts and collaborate with people on social media and things like that. And ultimately try to 
share my knowledge and experience with as many people as I can, but also to be a sponge and soak up and learn from everybody else as well. So definitely, if you've heard what I have to say today and you're interested in chatting and learning more, I'm certainly open to any and all collaboration. It's like I said, I'm a one woman show right now. So I have a lot of freedom in the direction that I get to go in. And that's where it's fun that I get to see who comes into my life and ultimately what direction that takes me in. I'm a one woman show too. And I know there's a lot of solopreneurs out there, so you're not alone, but thank you again very much for joining us and sharing all that wonderful information uh, with the audience. And so that will conclude today's episode. And I want to just tell everybody to make sure that you come back next Monday to be there, be mindful. And if anything Carly said with you resonates with you, make sure you get in touch with her. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Laura. Thanks.